there to Laurie Schwab with the New York Cosmos. Johnson. Jones, this looks dangerous for a Brisbane Lions. Jones, a good cross. Johnson. Arnold's forward, so is Manis Lamont. Still Robbie Slater. Twisting and turning, getting that one across. Lamont! Manis Lamont! from Heidelberg United and another local product, Charlie Ankus. How do you feel, Charlie? Uh, a bit nervous, but uh, I think I'll get used to it, get used to it and really put in 100%. Good evening, Tim. Thanks for joining me, mate. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time out on a busy weeknight, especially uh, during lockdown. How the hell are you? Mate, I'm really well. Thanks for having me on, George. Absolutely fantastic. We're talking um, Tim Schleiger. I'll just do the proper <laughs> introduction. Tim Schleiger, who's got a bit of skin in the game, um, played a lot of junior football, played for one of the biggest clubs, the club of the century in Oceania, if uh, you'll listen to anyone who'll tell you, in blue and white, played for South Melbourne Hallets, um, and retired early, it's fair to say, um, around 22. Is that right? Gave it up around 22. Yeah, just had a, had a constant run of injuries. That, that's yeah. right. So, yeah. um, but was also felt pretty, pretty focused on the fact that I had another course um, to, to travel on. Um, so I always loved the game, but um, just felt that I was better off going down that path. Which which has um, kept you in touch with the game, which is um, especially why I'm talking to you because you've not not left the game one little bit. You've uh, like I said, got plenty of skin in it, and you've been involved in it. Um, in many cases at a pretty high level, but behind the scenes. So we'll get to that. But um, let's go back to early days, yeah. 1974. Is that correct? You're a young fella. That was when I was born, yeah. Born in, born in Melbourne. In, yeah, born in Melbourne, out in, uh, in Mitcham. Yeah. Grew up out in, in Doncaster in the, uh, the good old days when, uh, you know, every second house was a, a Greek or Italian, which was sort of helpful. There was probably more soccer balls flying around the streets than footies anyway. In Doncaster, uh, for sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doncaster, absolutely. So, um, so I had, had a lot of fond memories of, uh, of sort of getting into the game, um, you know, uh, the way I did. It was sort of, it was interesting. I sort of felt like I, I fell into it a little bit and then before I knew it, I was, I was playing at a decent level. So what, was there a family influence at all, a German background? Yeah, no, so German background, um, but I've actually come from a family of, uh, of musicians, so they're all oh, really? classical. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite an untold story, but they're all uh, two older sisters that worked as music teachers and singers, and my brother was a, a, um, a sort of a, a, a pianist as well. Um, and then so me being a bit younger was a bit of the black sheep. Um, but we'd started watching some of those cup finals with uh, Riccardo Villa and, um, and the Spurs cup finals back in the day. Um, and I remember on the old phones where you'd, you could ring up and get the overseas Division I soccer results. And I think as a young kid, um, initially I followed Ipswich Town because um, they were, it was that year that Villa just pipped them. I can't remember quite. It must have been 81, I reckon. 
Yeah, that, that was a, that, that, that period, yeah. Peter Witt, Peter Witt, yeah. Yeah, and, and Villo had, had Peter Witt and a few others that were pretty dominant. Um, so, yeah, so we sort of watched that and then just from playing in the backyard, um, I literally, um, you know, uh, turned up at Doncaster Rovers and played a lot of junior football there and did all that back in the good old days of the regionals. Um, so sort of the Eastern region versus the central and Northern and Western. Yep. And, yep. and so before you know it, you're, you're sort of in the under 12, uh, development squads, you know, for Victoria, which I remember, uh, Tim White and, um, uh, Alan Alexander. Yeah. Um, yeah I know of Alan. So sort of through that era, that was all sort of, um, who do we have a, a great, so we had, um, Frank Gurich, the keeper. Yep. Um, and Dr. Kev, Kevin Musket was our year. And uh, then there were always, I still see a lot of the Macedonian boys today with uh, like Itze Kutlosovsky and yep. Lauren Bizimovsky and so those guys. So it was a, it was a really good side. Um, and so sort of, you know, some years you'd, you'd just miss, you'd get that cut at 20 and you'd go home gutted and, you know, so sort of finally, um, you know, Got it. Got in there to a few of the teams, and you know, enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, and then we had a coach in there somewhere that I remember. That was at the stage when the Super League yeah. was was at the yeah. deal, and and so we left Doncaster and finished up out at uh, Faulkner. Okay. Um, so for a year, and then that was the stage when Tony Dunkley. Uh, came in as the as a sort of assistant state coach and took over South Melbourne under 16s. Uh, okay. um, so that was a good side. I remember it had um, uh, we had the, the a few younger guys in there like Aaron Healy and Frank Bott and a few of those guys went on and played Aussie under 17s the year the year younger than me. Um, and then some of the late developers like Elite Samirkus, I know, got a few games out at Heidelberg and yeah. still catch up with Big Lee a little bit. Yeah. Um, and um, and then, like I said, next thing you know, you're playing in the – they had the Colts and then the youth teams and all that sort of stuff at South Melbourne and developing friendships through those state teams at the old Nationals at Park Lee. And it's just amazing about football how long those relationships last. Yeah, well, that's – well, we constantly say that one thing we, we can take away, you can be, you can play at the highest level, you can play at the lowest level, and at the end of it, it really, you end up with pretty much friends. And yeah, for life. Mates for life. Um, so yeah. it really doesn't matter. It's such a great thing, and that's what we want for our kids going through is they don't necessarily have to be the next Harry Kuehl, but they just have a fulfilling career or sporting life, whatever you, however you want to describe it. And come to the and, end and of like the night. And like I say to my kids as well, it's often it's often a scenario where often your opponents, you know, like I remember in the early under twelves, under thirteens, I remember we used to get battered by the West, where they had uh, Matze Tosevsky, who also I think he's the president at Altona Gate now. Okay. Um, and he played quite a few NSL games with the Knights and a lot of Premier League uh, or State League action in those yep. days. Yep. yep. Um, and then. Um, what else did we have? And, and and then yeah, just but those guys battered us every time we played them. We had um, Joe Hasty, the younger brother of Will. Uh, yeah. Will Hasty was obviously well known to all. And um, yeah. so yeah, but then by the time we finally pegged them back by about fifteen, sixteen, and 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 got them, so it was uh, they were great memories. Yeah, well, it's funny you should say not just your teammates, but the guys that you played against. Not only yesterday, I did an interview with um, a former teammate. We, well, I was at West United, which was in St Albans. He was at Green Gully, yeah. so we were literally neighbours in turn, but which made you rivals because you were so close. Um, yeah, absolutely. But here we are, thirty odd years later, um, still chatting, still see each other at the football. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Still in touch and still sharing um, photos on my world is round and still pinpoint oh, I knew I went to school with him he went to school with me and that sort of stuff and so that just will never stop I guess and it continues oh. on which is a wonderful and that's like you said someone who I played against um, played I think a handful of regional games together and that the regional com conversation yeah. came up again 
you know, what's yeah. happened to the regionals when we're talking about player development and compare the old and the new. Well, there doesn't seem to be this regional um, system anymore, which seemed to help um, offer a pathway in the past. Oh. And, you know, the regional, you know, your regional trials were a big deal and then the regional yep. tournament, knowing that you had to do enough to get into a state squad again. And, yep. you know, guys, you know, guys were shattered if they had an injury or whatever and missed out and thought, yep. oh, well, that's my, that's my journey towards the state team for this year done because I'm injured or whatever. Mm. Um, I think quite a few good players missed a year here and there with, with injury at some point. And, you know, it was a big deal. Yeah. No, that's right. So... Dad wasn't a football person, as you said. I assume you probably said he was also... No, he was, he was a mathematician, so that was okay. another one that was part of... just wasn't really into it, so I think... Would he come uh, and watch? He came and watched a little bit, yeah. but they were sort of pretty... Um, I laugh about this, though. Pretty, and, and Mum was a, a sort of pianist as well, so the, the whole thing about turning up to um, a nice, aggressive, parental, uh, racial kind of scenario was... Uh, was Quite different shock. Yeah, yeah, big culture shock. Yeah. I got used to it very quickly and, you know, learned to swear in multiple foreign languages very quickly and developed a good temper, which, which stood me well in those early days. But, um, but yeah, like, it's, it's just, it was good that we found a way, and, and I see it with my kids now, where you find a way and there's always a willing parent. Like, I don't think my parents took me at all, or my mum took me at all to Faulkner, for one training session. Did you go by yourself? I just went either, um, uh, there was another family member, okay. or sorry, another, um, another team member whose parents said, well, if, if we can get Tim to Faulkner, that'll be good. So, um, perfect. We'll, uh, I'll just pick him up every week. And it, was, and it was those sort of parental stories that, again, those parents that drove, you know, um, kids to be able to create options. I think a massive one for me also uh, when I was at South Melbourne was um, uh, Papa Joe Hasty, so Will and yep. Joe's dad, who's still going around. And um, we caught up with actually during the uh, the period out of lockdown, yep. I had a bit of a, a feed at the, the Malvern Vale with Itze Kutlasovsky and Will Hasty and Chris Hoodless. Yep. And it was as much for me, it was a thank you just to go, geez, I probably wouldn't have got home from soccer training on countless nights, especially once we started four nights a week at, at South. Yeah. Uh, with those youth teams without him. Okay. So you, you've listed him as um, a, a big influence um, on your football. Um, now, he played for Heidelberg. I know that when he came to Australia. I'm pretty sure that yeah. that's right. Yeah. But yeah. am I also right saying he played for Celtic as well before he came so, out? So, yeah... I'm not entirely sure that 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 in a complete history of Papa Joe. That was always one of the generous things about him. He spent more time talking about you than, and he was always making sure that his boys were okay. Yeah, um, a real champion doesn't talk about himself. Yeah, correct, correct. And and um, yeah. So and then obviously Will was uh, pretty driven at that point to get himself over there, um, which we were talking about the small worlds, whereby it was Jackson Irvine's mum that helped create that initial trial for Will. Okay. Uh, and then obviously in a later life, I've um, helped uh, Jackson at different stages with his strength and conditioning and rehab and different stages when he's been in Melbourne and obviously have the link through Croydon with um, Jacko's father as well. Okay. All right. We'll get, we'll get to that. I'm certainly very, very interested um, with work you've done with so many elite players. It's um, quite interesting. Um, I, also, I want to talk about a bit more about your time at South. Like you played with some gun players, um, you finished up reasonably young, but you were still what you had four or five years there. In, yeah, in no, so, so I played under sixteens, and then we had a year where we got um, you know that that baptism of fire where we played as the they had the Colts yep. team. Um, so that was when you were a year younger. Um, and so we had uh, Tony Dunkley look after us again that year, and we, you know, it was it was a big deal because you were you were 16, 16 year old bodies, and you'd be coming up against not only some eighteen year olds, but then also senior players 
coming down. So I remember at the old Middle Park ground playing in the Colts as a 16-year-old and having, I think, um, Adelaide City at the time were obviously bringing some players back from injury. And so they had um, Joe Barbaro, Carl Viet, Ross Aloisi playing in central midfield. And we got torn a decent one that day. But it's also just a, a great baptism of fire to see see what you needed to do to be competitive. And it was amazing getting thumped like that if you had the right mentality by the time you came back a hell of a lot more stronger and determined and worked on facets of your game. The following year when we ended up in the, uh, when I was in the, the, the Whites team, the, um, uh, the youth team, Sam Myers coach, who was the, the first, I think it was a, probably some of the happiest memories of, of football in my life where we basically just, you know, we were, we were sketchy. They, they kept on a few players. So there was Rossi Caleveris, uh, Pete Zamoranis and Pete Nicola Coppolis, all who got a few senior games um, at South, and um, and Michael Valkanis as well, who was you know another um, teammate of mine. And we just he just his 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 commitment to us, you know, talking to us about uh, what it required to make it as players, and he had this great saying: "You must live the sport life." You know, it was all about living the sport life. And I think probably, you know, he would, he really had us training four nights a week. We'd get, have to get there at five. So I'd, um, I'd get on a few trams and trains and buses and so forth to, to get there in time. And we'd finish three hours later. Um, and he'd even have us in school holidays. He'd have one of the boys pick him up and we'd, we'd jump the fence and get on the senior pitch um, at, uh, at sort of 6am. And, and I think that work ethic he had, there'd be often, even in that year, we'd have players who were sort of fringe players or had come through him as well, like Bootsy and yep. um, Michael Michaela Coppola, Steve Tassios was coming back from one of those knee injuries and Kimon would also come and join us. So it was a sort of, it was a, it was a, it was a real, um, I think it, it just showed how much respect they had for Sam and, 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 what we what what he was able to instill in players with mentality and work ethic, and you know I say this a lot. Like we probably I think we might have been third or fourth in that uh, bottom after the first couple of games, and you know I remember there was all sorts of talk that you know what's going on with this South Melbourne team and uh, who's coming through in the youth, uh, and we ended up uh, winning the the league you know outright and then playing the finals and we beat. Preston on penalties, which, you know, had a decent side, like Nick Georgiopoulos and I think Goran Lozanovsky was playing that day and yep, yep. Nick Kukoletsky. And so some really good, good young players. Um, and then I remember Pete, Nicola Coppolis and I both had uh, accumulated too many yellow cards again. Um, and so we missed the final against um, Melbourne, so Sydney, Croatia and uh, there was oh, a young guy. The national final. Was that, yeah. For the national final. It was Olympic Park. And um, it was the, uh, it was, there was a young guy coming through by the name of Ante Milicic that just killed us. <laughs> but as he often gave us a fair bit of stress at the, every time in the, in the nationals, it was always Ante Murray, Ante Milicic making life hell. And they were handy sports, weren't they? Yeah. And, and Kev would then do his best to, read the game, make his great passes, lead us, but then obviously every now and then lay some studs on them as well. No, okay. So were you, what position were you playing as a junior and as you were making your way through? So, so I started up till 16, I was probably always fit and strong, better than sometimes as a player, I always thought. And so I would played centre midfield and just grafted box to box in that old sort of... Uh, old sort of style way, knowing that I'd eventually outrun people. And then by the time I got with Sam, he was pretty adamant that I, um, that I, that he said to me, look, you're fit, you can just run at people and just run them up and down a wing. So he was sort of back playing that sort of five, three, two in those days. And um, he just had me on my bike, as the Poms would say. And it was just a, a, a job sort of I loved. Uh, and then it wasn't until sort of playing some senior games with with um, the, the senior team and then later on when I went to uh, Croydon on loan and then 
finished up there as well that he just learned that there was possibly a, um, a time to go rather than just exactly. always getting on the bike with youthful exuberance and you have actually got to be accountable and defend at some point too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. So you're 16, 17, 18, you're playing for a coach, which for a young kid, it's important that the right coach, the right time, not just for your football, but just general, your life, the mental side of things. Yeah. So he's he's obviously offering you something special because you're going from Doncaster to Middle Park. It's not South Melbourne. Yeah. It's, it's, it's St Kilda, right? You're, it's, a, it's a fair hike four it was, times a it week. It was a decent hike down on, the, uh, on that sort of the light rail from Spencer Street in the day. <laughs> Correct. So it, it's, it's a huge commitment, but... People do it because they want to do it, right? Yeah. Like you were clearly driven um, and self-driven. And, well, you tell me, was was there periods when you're thinking this is not worth it or was that never even, didn't even enter you? Never. And even in year 12, there was, there were, like I was on the train and the light rail there till, um, and we often wouldn't leave training until uh, probably... Um, what was it, about probably often 7.38. And so then I'd have to get back to Doncaster if, if Joe Hastie's um, dad wasn't available. And I'd then have to get my way back to Doncaster and then start studying, certainly in year 12, mm. um, to then just do enough to, obviously, you're young at that stage, so you think you're going to play and all that sort of stuff and injury's never going to come into it. Um, and... But the drive was absolutely there. Um, and then to then start, well, getting getting a bit of taste of senior football and all that sort of stuff was just uh, a great, great opportunity. And then, and I think, so that year that I think we'd won, won that league at South Melbourne and then um, I got asked to go on loan as a 17-year-old to Croydon City. Okay. Um and Graham French was coach. So yeah. the, the glory Croydon days had just come off a tat. Um, but they still had some wonderful leaders like, you know, um, Andy Humble still running around. And Graham Hayes was actually, uh, it was his last season, but sort of assistant coach as well. And there was um, uh, Jimmy McBride as well. Archie McGeechee. So there were some there were some handy players. Uh, we just probably played. I felt a lot of that year we we would just like if it was a two all draw. Come we we just cop a bad goal or whatever it was, and so we we survived. Um, and I my loan period had finished, and then I went back to South Melbourne to do yeah. my first pre season, um, and with the seniors. Yeah, knowing and, uh, what you know now, and the answer's pretty straightforward. But do you remember what the 17-year-old kid who went out on loan, how he worked in with these senior pros? How, did you immediately realise, well, you tell me, what we, where, where, was it was the negativity? Was it all positive? Was there an adjustment period? Because you're playing with kids kind of your own age. And against seniors every now and then, but this is think, now working with seniors. You know, yeah, you know, I think I think um, I had some memorable stories because I laugh about them with um, with these guys because I still see them today. But I do recall r- running on, and and the thing about the the the, the NSL boys at South Melbourne is they were a, a very skillful side, but South Melbourne were not a nasty physical side ever. Like they they didn't need to be because they had such good ball players. Yeah. Um, but when I went out to Croydon, and you know, and there was there was some physical English lads that that's the way they played, and it was a nice little reminder that if you just thought you were going to come in with a bit of a reputation, you know, as a, a kid with a, a good future coming through, that you were going to get a bit of a reducer quite early. Um, and so Jimmy McBride provided a few great poignant moments that we still laugh about today whether it was a little elbow training and just reminding you that you know that's all part of it and all that sort of stuff so it was we we had a a great time and then then literally within a week or two I'd forced my way into the starting 11 there and I I played you know 13 or 14 games 
um, on loan, full 90 minutes. So I sort of felt like, you know, physically I belonged, um, you know, to play senior football, even at 17, and not, and could be very physical in return as well. Okay. Yeah, because the state league in that era, not just Croydon alone, a lot of the sides, that it's just that was the state of play back then. It was, right. it was a pretty physical league. It was yeah. your, your finesse players, but they were few and far between. But generally, it was a difficult league to play in. If you couldn't handle the hard stuff, you weren't going to survive oh, in two weeks. No, you're gone. Absolutely gone. Yeah, so, so you adjusted to that well. Okay, so you've gone back to South and take the story from there. Well, so I went back to South and then had a had a, a pretty good uh, pre-season. And so I'd had I'd missed sort of through the youth. By proxy, I'd had a bit to do, um, obviously, with, with Jimmy Pirgolios, who was the assistant coach to Puskas. Yep. And he and Sam Meyer had spoken a bit. So they'd obviously won those t- that title and um, Puskas had moved on. But setting and the so scene, you were in that youth team and Puskas was the senior coach, right? Yeah. Correct, yeah. yeah. And so then now that now that I'm moving in and, and training with the seniors, um, you know, you're walking into a change room. And if I remember rightly, they just signed Francis Awaratifi, um, had been one of the signings. Um, who else was there? There was uh, uh, Dean Anastasiades, who I'd played games against because I reckon he was at Faulkner that year where Branko Kalina was coaching, maybe, or that might have been a couple of years later. Uh, but Dean, Dean had definitely been signed, and Kev had been signed. So, Kevin Musket, so, obviously, with the state team, link and whatever else Kev had come across from, would have been a George Cross or Heidelberg, even. It was Heidelberg after. It might have been Heidelberg. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, pre-season for me was fun because, you know, in terms of the fitness stuff, I was able to push and, you know, certainly give people a few headaches with repeat efforts and so forth. Um, so, you know, that was the beginning of my my great relationship with Steve Blair where it was always like, easy Schlager, easy. Just take it easy Schlager, you know, like. And that would often be because he didn't want to have to do the repeat effort again at my pace. So he'd just say, come on, just the old dog's here. Just you don't have to go out too fast. Just, just cool your jets, son. Um, tell us, and tell, so we, tell us about the great man because you played with him, you you trained with him. I just just the, the consummate pro, uh, great talker um, in terms of on the pitch, and that's that's a big thing I sort of look at today. Where it's amazing, you know, like not that he ever needed, but it, but if say the ball from the centre half was given to a number six or someone like a Mickey P. You'd be pretty loudly told, turn, turn, time, man on, whatever. So there was some pretty clear messages, whereas now it's amazing you hear a lot of the centre halves and it's just you can hear these crickets. There's just no talk at all. So yeah. very rarely beaten in the air, very rarely beaten in the tackle. Uh, his timing on his challenges was magnificent and he could pass the ball. And look at all the games he played. He was just... Uh, he, was was just say, he, was, he was there a long time, but he, he was really at the top of his game for maybe a 10-year period, which... I think, yeah, gets, absolutely. It gets forgotten. Yeah, it gets forgotten. It's understated. Yeah, just has gone. Yeah. He, I mean, and, he, and, he and Brucey, uh, McLaren, just offering that. And then, of course, then once you put... Um, you know, Bruce was a top keeper and his talking was magnificent. Like, the, the games I played with Bruce, like, you, you were just so clear on get on your bike or go or just calm down, you know. So, you really... You really sort of, you know, had a um, some great great opportunities there, but were surrounded by such good players as well. Yeah, I think people forget, and look, I might not be right on factual, but I think people forget that he gave up his opportunity to play for the Socceroos. I might be making some of this up, but I think him and Jeff Olver both worked at the RACV at about the same time when a tour was on or something, and yeah. um, Stevie gave up his chance to go to work. So that I know, he, the, I know he definitely got some taps. taps. I know Steve yeah, he definitely got, some got taps. Taps. yeah, but he would have got more. And I think he self-sacrificed, and Jeff was the beneficiary. Family. Not because yeah. they were in the same position, but I think they both worked yeah. at the RACME. There might be a tweak yeah. on that story, but I don't think it's far-fetched. And 
there was some. And I reckon I reckon Bruce McLaren was there as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So there might have been a few of them that uh, sacrificed yeah. their international careers, but um, outstanding career. Mr. Pushkas. Not many people uh, can talk about him. How how um, how did that go? I, I look to be honest. I think, and this is something I also I've said before, is is part of the reason looking from the outside as a young guy coming up was yes, they had a lot of talent, but they had such good on field leaders. So I think everyone was in awe of of Puskas, you know, and the man. And so that gave a lot of people confidence. And then when you combined it with, you know, players like, you know, back in those days, I remember the NSL games got um, rescheduled. If there was four or more, I think it was four or more players had to go and play for Australia. And so that just meant Adelaide City at the time with their three or four players that they had and South Melbourne with the standard, you know, um, Durakovic, Wade, Peterson, Trimboli. Trimboli, and then and sometimes even Kim on on, on a few occasions. Yes. So those games were just, um, and then that was the other thing in those days. You also they didn't get um, they didn't get uh, transferred for twenty threes games, but then on top of that, sometimes South then would lose uh, Kevin Musket, Butianis, uh, Gary Hasler yes. as well when when he was there. So. Um, you know, so there was so much talent there. Um, it was it was a great football side. So Puskas was there. The awe of the man was was there. But then I think then that just allowed these leaders to then really uh, feel empowered to just do their do what they did. And I tell you what, still a training. I've still got memories of looking on after we'd finished and, and, you know, he's just, he looked like obviously he's pretty overweight at the time and so forth, but he could just get a soccer ball and put a top corner wherever he wanted, you know, and, and Michael Lillacarcus and Bruce McLaren, the two keepers were like, going, how the f*** you do that? You know, so the talent was just off the charts. So that's, that's not a myth, that's fact, right? No, that was, that was, that was a dead, that was unbelievable. Yeah, because I've heard it from where a do want, Where do you want me to put it? Bang, there. <laughs> The old left footer, tried, yeah. tried and trusted, still work. Yeah, yeah no, that's yeah. Right. Okay. All so right. then at yeah. training, yeah. yeah, so to finish on that, so then on training, I guess yeah. you then had those boys, and he often just used to sit up. Peter Goliath would do a lot of the leg work and the warm-ups and so forth, but they really just got to sit back and watch these guys run the show when you've got Blairy and Mickey P and Wadey and Trimmers as a spine with Durakovic at the back. And then, you know, obviously Bootsy was coming through. Kimon was always there. Um, Steve Tassios was a great player. He was, he was, and then obviously, more importantly, you know, Ange for so many years as well, yeah. uh, playing his trade. Yeah, yeah. You know, he, he, was, he was a bit stiff to finish up young-ish based on some of his injuries, um, but it probably helped his coaching career in, in some aspects. Um, well, there is a story. Yeah. There. There is actually, there's a story I had left by then, but I believe it's true that Frank Arrock got him into coaching, and the and the story was that because um, his knee, from my perspective, what I do now it was like you know getting doing an ACL back then wasn't like what it was today. Yeah, and so you know you, most most of your players are guaranteed to be back going pretty well at twelve months. And Ange was really hobbling and he'd lost three or four yards. He'd lost a lot of range. I would love to have, you know, known now what I knew back then. I could have, you know, obviously helped him out. Um, but so for him, he really, it, it really struck the talent short because he lost that zip up the left that he always had. Yeah. Um, and if you can't trust your body at that level, obviously you can't play. So apparently Frank Arrock had said to him, Knowing that he was slow, he said, "Right, we're going to do a, a run. Let's call it a box-to-box -box run. And if you don't come last, Ange, you um, you play this weekend. And if you come last, you've got to retire and be my assistant coach." Oh wow! And uh, by all accounts, he came last, and that set him on his road to coaching. Yeah. So one one door closes, another yeah. huge window opens up. Why? It's funny how uh, that works. That's an inch. I'd never heard that. Uh, I, I, I knew, went in. Knew Frank had been, you know, at the club when it happened, but didn't realise. But that. I think he needed that blunt thing to go. You know, right, mate, come on. And it's tough, you know, 
because you know and probably without that me would have had two or three more years but I, I do have some really fond memories of, of me trying to get in at either left back or right back and you know when you're the old dog and you you know there's two ways you can go you can either kill kill the youngster or um you know or try and bring him through and there were countless times where Ange pulled me aside and gave me some really wonderful advice and I remember thinking at the time even at you know 18 that I thought this bloke could go on and become a really good coach Mm. so I was obviously to go on and see his story um and the way he backed himself um in any situation was was never a surprise knowing the man at that age just one for me, one of my quirky ones, because it's it's part of folklore as well. Gary Hassler ended up at South Melbourne by mistake, right? I Bushkis, believe that story is true. That, that's a fact, right? Bushkis left for the summer in the off-season, told the yeah. committee to go and sign the blonde boy from George Cross. Yeah. And when, he came, <laughs> when he came back from Greece or wherever he, overseas, Hungary, wherever he came back from, um, and he went to pre-season training. Hassler was running around and he said, who the hell is this bloke? And they said, well, that's the blonde bloke. He said, no, I wanted the other one. Um, yeah. Now, that's fact. What really interested me at the time, I was a young guy <laughs> ploughing my trade, trying to work out how the hell Gary Hassler went from provisional one to playing at George Cross in the NSL. That was a huge leap. But his dad was the team manager at George Cross, so I could yeah. live with I could live with that. But then, the mistake signing to South Melbourne, and then he played for the Socceroos. Now this guy went from Provisional One to playing for the Socceroos, and we're talking about that's a seven seven tier um, jump. Was he that good? Come on, <laughs> he he had a he had a ripping left foot, and it it kind of worked out I think for him as well that he was able to play he defensively wasn't too bad so he was able to act, sit in tank. as a left had a tank yeah. had a good tank yeah. and then he could sometimes play left midfield yes, harry michael had a few injuries at the time tass was injured so he sort of between he and danny wright they sort of just became those uh well he obviously was a left-sided utility whereas danny wright ended up playing anywhere but keeper yeah. um i always did an amazing job so yeah look i think and i i you know, I, again, I put it back onto the guys like Trimmers and um, and Paul Wade and and so forth that that gave gave people the confidence once they once they were in. And I, and I tell this story a lot where um, Trimmers, I think, so I, I'd played a couple of Doherty Cup games um, out at Bulleen. We played one, then we'd have one of those good old fashioned Wednesday night double headers where we uh, beaten the Knights. And um, a young Johnny Veracarcus actually had a ripping game that night. Um, it was one of the other young boys. Mickey Volcanus was playing his first few games. Yeah. Um, and I remember then playing on the s- that Saturday um, against a Victorian team. And Trimmers had just come back to start pre-season. And he'd, he'd been on, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's common folklore about Trimmers that you know, if he'd have <clears throat> valued maybe the physical side of his fitness as much, maybe he would have been and played at that higher level a bit more. Oh, yeah, and, and he had some trials. He had some trials. But he did he have had, some trials. He had opportunities, but he didn't want to go. Yeah, and so, and but, you know, maybe because he didn't never really overtrain to that nth degree, maybe he wouldn't have played 400 games. So who's to say? But he was a fantastic player. And I remember lining up against you know, a, a Victorian team that had, you know, all the old stalwarts of, you know, I think V-Man, Frankie Valentic was playing and uh, SP was playing and Sean Douglas, I reckon Harold, Paul Harris would have been playing. Yeah, yeah. So it might have been just before they, they went up into the NSL with Morwell. And I remember thinking, oh, these are all the guys I've played against in the off-season in the State League. I belong here. Um, and just having a, a, a really good game. And... I remember it started, though, because it was the first game where Brucey was back and um, as well. And and Trimmers has come over and he was definitely carrying four or five kilos he shouldn't have. And in saying that, he still was best on ground by a country mile off no training at all. But he said, he said, look, it's pretty easy to play in this team. 
He said, if you've got any doubt, just knock it back to Mehmet or Blairy. Look for my feet and look for Mickey P. And he said, if you find Mickey P, what you'll love about Mickey P and what you do in your job is just get on your bike because every time there'll be a trace of bullet and the ball will be on your foot. You'll never have to run back because the players missed your run. Yeah. And I've got to say, that was my experience. It was just like, how good's this? So I just got going and it was another trace of bullet right on the foot. And it was just, it was a dream. Um, but then he also said, look for my feet. He said, whatever you do, don't give it to Wadey. And I said, <laughs> and I'm coming as an 18 year old going, but hang on, he's Captain Socceroo. Like, you know, what the hell is this about? He goes, yeah, but he's terrible. He, he gives the ball away all the time. Yeah, he's better at winning the ball. <laughs> he's better at winning the ball than he is, you know, and he win everything in the air. But just, so I came in at half time and got a bake from Wadey because he was saying, you've got to fucking give me the ball, son. You know, and I'm going, like, what am I going to say to Captain Socceroo? But the reality was they were the instructions and they were working fine. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, uh, Trimmers gave you the street smart advice. The street smart advice, which, which worked well. Yeah, and uh, it sounds like Trimmer's right down to a T. And uh, he knew a little bit about the game too, didn't he? Oh, All right. Brilliant, brilliant mind. Uh, so where and how does it progress from here? So I played, I played a couple more games uh, after that. We played a Doherty Cup final <laughs> against Preston, um, which was, you know, in that game, and there was a, a, one of the, thir- the Wednesday nights at Olympic Park where the stadiums were just packed. Um, and I think it must have been nine, about 1992. And um, the old owner of Marathon Foods, Big Jack, was adamant that we were um, to not lose to Preston for obvious reasons and blah, blah, blah. And I was looking around the room going, how many Greek boys are actually in this team? But <laughs> anyway, um, so, yeah, I sort of I started out okay. And, and then I think we went down, um, I do remember a very funny story um, without throwing anyone under the bus here, but the, the, the thing was, you know, Sean Parton in the air was a bit like Blair. He never lost a header. So one of the things, and brilliant with those, absolutely brilliant. Discreet, so, very discreet. Very discreet, very discreet. So we, um, I just remember there was a corner and the rules were on all the set pieces and corners that Francis, who wore a teepee, was meant to come back and mark him. And um, anyway, the ball's been knocked straight to the back post and I'm on the back post as a fullback. And then I've looked and there's Sean Parton with a good 10 metre free run at the ball. And then I've looked again and um, there's Francis Oratifi up on the centre line. <laughs> so I thought, here we go. So I sort of ran at him in a way to not give a penalty, knowing to put enough pressure and he's knocked it across and Andrew's in, he's knocked it in. So of course, uh, Bruce started screaming at me. Mehmet started screaming at me. And then I looked at Bruce and I said, but it wasn't my fault. What do we say about the corners? He goes, that's right. That's Francis' fault. Hey, you start screaming at Francis. So we had this whole thing. And then I remember coming off after that and it sort of coincided with Kev coming back from overseas duties and whatever else and um, under 23s. And I just could see I was going to be in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, and I just had such a great time at, at Croydon the year before, like the, earlier. And a lot of people had been advising me at the time that, you know, it's re- how difficult it is to break in as a young person at South Melbourne. Yep. No different from what they talk about at Victory. Yeah, correct. And, they, and, and people have been telling me, look, Very you simple. want to play as much regular football as you can. Um, and then if you can come back in at 21, 22 to these sides, then that'd be great. So... So I went out, went back to Croydon, um, where Terry Hennessy had just come in, um, and it was a great environment because it was sort of my my sort of real introduction to all the music men lads because they signed, um, you know, Martin Woodall. Um, who else do we have there? We had Carl Gilder, who was in his last year, um, who was just an absolute classic, great teacher. It was funny because it was amazing how much. Paul Trimboli talked about Paul was very good at uh, shielding the ball and sticking his big ass into people and the way he could well, they're, turn off. They're, there's the two of them, Carl and, and Trim. Yeah. And, and Trim is openly says, coming through at George Cross as a youngster, that 
Gilbert, as he was known, um, taught him a lot. So he had a, I had that year. There was there was um, Dean Hennessy was there as well, uh, Andy O'Dell, and it was just an introduction to the the English humour on steroids, which I loved anyway. Um, but unfortunately, sort of very early on in that season, I bulged a disc in my back, mm-hmm. and it was sort of the beginning of the the issue. So I didn't play all year. Um, and you go and see physiotherapists and uh, chiropractors and so forth. And I just felt no one really had much of an idea. Um, so I missed that entire season. Went turned up to all the games and training and loved the, being around the boys and, and so forth. And, um, and then the following year, I remember Croydon just missed relegation. And we had another year with... Um, so David Davy Jones came in as coach, the Welshman, yeah. who, who was who was just his standard line. He had that, that the teeth that he'd pull out and then just stick it into your beer, and then put his teeth back in and say that's mine. I was like, thanks, coach. Um, and that was probably his level of ta- tactics as well, too. Wasn't it? Cur- well, yeah. No, so J- Jonesy was Jonesy was Jones was very good at because I think. The budget was going. It was. It was quite. He was very really good at swearing. <laughs> he was great at swearing. Uh, he was very good at at trying to create an us versus them mentality, knowing that there was very little money at the club anymore. The Antonis um, l- sort of legacy at Croydon yeah. were long gone, yeah. so it was a bit of a shoestring budget. But we, you know, we we got Nick Van Egmond back, who was great to play with that year. We had. Um, Craig Cubitt at the back. We still had, um, you know, a couple of young boys that we were playing. Renato Liberto, I reckon, might have been oh, yeah. one of his last years at, in the, the Premier League. And we, Darren McGrath, who was a, the goalkeeper there, who famously that year, and that was really the sign we knew we were going down, was um, we played Port Melbourne and Darren went surfing thinking the game was on the Saturday. And it was on the Saturday, not the Sunday. So we ter- had no keeper that day. So one of the Resi's kids had to play. We got done six zip. Okay. Um, and you just thought, Darren, where are you? I'm down the beach. And I was like, what the fuck? Nothing's, nothing's going well when you... When you when going you well here. So when I, I did my, my groin and had a whole um, bunch of surgeries and so forth. And I was sort of... I'd sort of... We got relegated... I, I sort of, I just sort of felt like my groins were okay, but not great. Uh, and I still wasn't getting a satisfactory response. I'd had a couple of surgeries. Um, I'd had a rumour that um, Branko Kalina had gone to Sydney United and he was perhaps interested in getting me up there. Um, and, then, uh, and then I went, oh, we'll just get another year going. So I went and trialled at Altona Gate for a bit with the Macedonian boys because Dobbo had just gone there. Yeah. Um, and then probably should have stayed there, but uh, stupidly, um, Charlie Egan got me to, asked me down to Werribee. So I did a pre-season down there, which was when I got acquainted to um, Cameron Brown for the first time because he did a couple of months of pre-season. And we got run ragged just as the game started. My groins were sore. You got through into- the whole of Charlie Egan's pre-season. The, the squats against the wall for five minutes and all that sort of stuff. Got through the whole thing. And then my groins were still no good. And I just sort of looked at it and I really kind of felt, you know what, I can, I can toil away at this, but I developed by the second year of my, my, my studies in um, human movement. I was showing interest in biomechanics. I got into a bit of the Eastern stuff as well at that point with a mentor that I found who was a, a Chinese doctor, but an ex-hard ass ice hockey player from the NHL. Okay. And I just kind of thought, you know what? I felt like I had a potential that I could never achieve because of injury. And I just felt ultrasounds and interferential machines aren't going to cut it. And I just from there went on to become a major um, pain in the ass with my lecturers and so forth to try and come up with a the thought process process which I still have today which is when a player comes in and they've got an injury I want them to have that sense like that mentor taught me was to 
you got to put their hand on the shoulder and going, mate, we'll get you right. We know what's wrong here and we'll get you right. Not, we'll try this, we'll try that. Because I was getting, you know, a couple of uh, pain-killing injections into my groins every two or three weeks to play. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it was just a hiding to nothing. And even at 22, you got the brains to go, well, where's this going to end up? Uh, and then that really set up the, the passion for then the, the next chapter, which I went away from football just for four or five years, which I, yeah. I needed to do. And, yeah. um, and then, uh, funnily enough, found my way, you know, back into it, um, you know, quite a few years later. Okay. So you went away, you did your study, you did your work. You're kind of refreshed in a way. I guess you would have been, there's, there's still got to be an aspect of you at 22 or whatever it was when you had to give it up. You made that conscious decision. You were, it was your decision. But there's still got yeah. to be a part of you. There's still a footballer inside you that still kind of has a what if ticking over. Some, a little bit. Yeah, it's absolutely. And, and, and seeing guys that you knew you were, you felt um, that if they were doing it, you could certainly still be doing it and so yeah, forth. Yeah. So okay. there, was, yeah. there, was, there was a lot of that for quite a few years. Um, but then I sort of also felt a little bit like, you, you know, that I just wanted to get, I'd been in pain a lot for a couple of years as well. And you just get to that point where you just want to feel well again yeah. and, and strong again and be able to do stuff again rather than going, oh, I trained Thursday night. I've, you know, rolled out of bed with a, pubic bone that's sore and my groins are sore and oh she's we've got a game on Sunday. Oh take the painkillers, get a jab and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah. That that can take a lot of the fun out of it as well. Yeah. Um so you didn't which, miss that. That I didn't miss at all. Mm. So that was where going away and 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 you know doing things like you know strength and conditioning levels back in you know 90 um that would have been 95 and, you know, finishing post-grad uni and uh, then going off and doing a couple of years of Chinese medicine, massage, um, you know, all that sort of stuff, a lot of sprint coaching, um, which had sort of been introduced to me by um, a wonderful guy who's still in the system. And I, I still remember this one day, he did everything he possibly could to help me get right. And that was um, Franz Vimper, who's used to, team up with Tex and I believe he's the under 20s coach. Twice in two Saturday. days his name's come up. <laughs> yeah and Franz was great because he he took me to Olympic Park on countless occasions, tried to improve my running gait which my biomechanical brain which I now understand is perhaps a bit of a gift as well was there and so I still send him the odd text just thanking him for his time you know, many years later, because that also sort of gave me a bit of a thing. Well, if you combine strength and conditioning stuff and stabilisation stuff and some of the deep tissue massage and some of the acupuncture and, and all the things that really is modern day physio and strength and conditioning and, yep. you know, it, it sort of started to become our normal. Yep. Um, so I remember helping a mate who was the high performance coach at the North Melbourne Giants by about 97. Um, and Brett Brown was coached then. And, yep. you know, we were trying to throw things in there like recovery sessions and, and yoga. How were they accepting it? Oh, what do you think in the 90s? What's well, this shit, you know? <laughs> D, I mean, DMAC, DMAC at the time was hard enough to get doing any kind of strength and conditioning work, let alone uh, stretch and sit still. Because this, I want to play ball, man you know, and all that sort of stuff. So it started to give me this insight and then working with a lot of AFL boys individually who were struggling with their injuries. It sort of gave me a really good insight into you start to see what is elite in a mindset um, that allows you then to see, yeah, well, that's why they're champions and that's why they're champions. And, and that's been part of the gift of the journey, really. What, what sort of things did you pick up on? I just think, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that question because I remember, so what happened was because I'd gone off and done a lot of stuff in the AFL, yeah. my journey back to soccer was um, years later because, I, and I still help different players along along the way, but so John Aloisi uh, wanted to get his last couple of years out of his body when he came back to Australia, had that year at Sydney where he'd done his hamstring. And so he went to school 
uh, in Adelaide with Luke Darcy, who I'd sort of rehabbed his um, knee after the second um, ACL of his. And so John had basically said, uh, who's the guy that I can see off out of the club that knows what they're doing and I'll just sort you. And he says, oh, you've got to go and see Schleitz. Um, and so JA came in and we quickly connected on that level of obviously on an experiential level, but then also um, uh, a level of that he, he knew what I was doing and that I'd, I'd get him back and he'd play regard. I mean, even though he's, his knee was cooked and he's the first to tee. He was really struggling, but we made some pretty tinkered with a couple of things with his gait and his training programs and his loads and so forth. I think he scored nine or 10 goals that final year um, and did a, did an amazing job. So all of a sudden you're starting to go, well, you know, you've seen all these AFL guys, you've seen, you know, um, and you just start to see that the, like what John did that year where he was prepared to do any little one percenter to get on the park for 90 minutes. And it was no different to, you know, some of the AFL boys that I'd worked with. Um, I now look at some of the cricketers um, and, and certainly that golden generation um, were all the same like that, is the, is the length of time um, and the things that they would do. I'd be more concerned about ringing them up going, hey, don't do 3,000 of those though. Whereas a lot of the time you're saying, make sure you do those exercises I gave you. Yeah, yeah. You'd be worried with those guys that they've done too much of it. Okay. So it's, it's that, that, that they would do anything to play. Okay. It just meant so much to them to play as many games as they possibly could. Yeah. Uh, as many minutes as they possibly could and do anything possible. Yeah. So time play. and effort was no concern. No concern. And then, and I think that was the same where you, where, I think after that, then when John started coaching and Vinnie Grella came back, who's a, a really good mate of mine, and, um, you know, Vinnie was cooked. You know, I think the list of soft tissue injuries that he'd had by the time he came back from uh, Blackburn Rovers was like, and it was just all mis body mismanagement stuff. Yeah. Um, that where, whereby the, the club would have him back. If it's a four-week injury, they'd have him back in 10 days. So, of course, it reoccurs. And it just shows how brutal that system is. So all of those guys over there have, have someone in their corner to look after them, to give them a perspective outside that of the club. Because over there, of course, if you get injured, we'll, we'll just piss you off and get another player in. So I know John used to have a, a Dutch guy that used to come and see him in Spain so that if he did an injury, he'd train away from the team. So by the time he could go back to the team, he was team training and available for selection that weekend just to make sure no one else got a game and an opportunity. You know, whilst he was injured, he needed to get back into that starting 11 as quickly as possible. So yeah. Vinny, Vinny, you know, just sort of said to me, look, I want to have uh, one last crack at trying to play, maybe one more World Cup. And that was a big one for a lot of those guys coming back. Um, so we set up a camp for him in Melbourne for six weeks where he basically just did everything with me for six weeks from, you know, Pilates and core conditioning, some yoga. I'd been in contact with Les Gellis a bit, who was the Socceroos physio at the time. Um, um, some strength and conditioning stuff, reworking a lot of the asymmetries and deficiencies that he's had, improved his gait. And even in that situation with doing everything, there was just so much scar tissue that, he did a calf again and was the classic example of, you know, he put his hand up and said, I'm done. And then we've had this ongoing relationship, relationship since where he works for base soccer now, uh, still lives in Italy, out of, in Empoli, and um, with his working with players will often say, well, go and see Tim and see what you think. And we try and give them a foundation so before these players went to Europe, they at least understood what was required of them to get them on the park. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he's, he'll send young players to you. What you, you, I'm just going through the list here that you said you've mentioned. A couple. You've also got Harry and Marco, Harry Kuehl and Bresciano and Valeri. Harry, by all intents and purposes, was a crazy trainer. He would work hard, harder, yeah. than, harder than most blokes. And to be honest with you, I don't think he's the most naturally – I think he's a talented footballer, but I don't think he's a natural. Like he doesn't have a, a first touch – 
like the Dukes. Like there's a there's a gap for me, right? So he would have had to work at that. And then obviously he had later on in his career, basically from the time he got to Liverpool, the body started to, to play up. And same situation. I'm a Liverpool supporter. And yeah. the whole length of time he was there, you would think that the fans are on his back. Whether or not that was true, I don't know. Poor guy was injured, but Rafa would play him when he was 50% fit. I could say that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm halfway around the world because he was that much better at 50% fit than the next bloke at 100% fit. But that's not helping Harry. So obviously at some point he'd realised his body's going downhill. Obviously, did he then put in that same amount of work? Yeah, I think I think I think Harry Harry's big issue was that he worked he put the volume in and he probably put too much work in. Right. And and the thing is you can say to players, you know, you want to be last off training pitch and first on the training pitch and first in for your rehab and all that sort of stuff. But you also only know what you know. And so at that stage in England, you know, as we know it as the 80s and 90s physiotherapists that were a bit of ultrasound, a bit of magic spray and no mechanical understanding, no corrective exercise, no specific warm-ups individualised to players' mechanics and needs. That did not exist when Harry was there. So it was unfortunate that if you got a decent groin injury, um, like I described that finished me up, thankfully Harry was probably smart enough at that stage where he's obviously on the money and he got Les Gellis, the soccer who's physio, and said, I need you to come and live with me. Yeah, that's and right. And probably I, I look at that and think if he hadn't have done that, he would have struggled to play much more football at any level. So I still think from the save that he got at Liverpool, and you look at his highlight packages at Liverpool, there's still some cracking goals. Oh, I know. He played some good football, but just not... I don't think... Yeah, I just don't think because of that injury, had Les not even intervened um, to offer that level of care, um, you know, then he really would have battled. But that was where he worked it out. After that, he got another uh, lady who's... She was based up at St George's Park in the UK and looked after the women's team. But she then went with um, Harry and the family over to Turkey with him. Um, and so he sort of quickly developed that idea that I need someone outside all the time, um, which I sort of provided for him when he was, you know, back in uh, Melbourne towards the end. And sort of it's also, sadly, it's, it's a tough gig when you're also sort of trying to help guys through when's the right time to finish. And how do I finish? So he was a he was a terrific trainer, and, and oh, look, he was still a, a highly skilled player, absolute gun. But his physical like fitness was pretty bloody insane. And I think I think sometimes I joked with you know a lot of those a lot of these junior players, and I say, listen, like when you're cross training an athlete in those early stages, just to vary loads. Marco Bresciano, uh, Vinny, Harry, um, Carl, who was sort of the last bastion of the old school, I reckon, at that level as well, um, and John, all of them would do eight three-minute rounds of boxing with me with 45 seconds off um, just as a warm-up. We're, we're doing some body sparring and that sort of stuff. Yeah. And they would do that no problem as a warm-up. And I just noticed I put similar. I put the next generation through similar workouts, and they need to go out for a spew after the second round. <laughs> or, and I was just saying, just a reminder that that was a level that just on that physical prep level that those guys just you know never ever ever missed. Yeah. And um, it was just an insight into the difference between, um, you know, say players who think they're bought up like I, I call them futsal players, where they've got every trick under the sun, but their ability to be, do repeat efforts on the ground and the simple things over and over again, make a run and get themselves into the position that's required to be in a goal-scoring position again. And again, they might only do it four times because they're the ones that are spewing at the two, second round as opposed to that guy that is making every run possible. And often sometimes those runs is a dummy run anyway to allow someone else to score or whatever else. Yeah, yeah. And I, do, I, I sometimes think, I don't think they even understand that. No, well, you it's know? Hard, hard to 
how to explain a dummy run to a dummy. Correct. Correct. <laughs> um, but how much of that with the old school guys that we mentioned, or you just mentioned, how much do you put down to just mental toughness as well? I think it's huge. And I think, you know, I think like when Johnny I had a chat to Johnny about it a while back when he did that um, interview with the lads um, on Optus on what's wrong with Australian soccer and all that sort of yep, stuff. Yep. And I think there's, there's a real element of, of that whole thing of, and even with Kev, um, you know, there was players in our group, like you really knew that in our state team that Kev and um, the keeper, um, Frank, Frank, yep. that they were going. It was, it was not if they were going to go, whereas probably for other people, give or take injuries, see how it goes. Maybe it's a pipe dream. Yeah. But it was the mental touch. Kev was going. And I think, I think we might have had Nick Radecki's 21st or something at um, Al Tony Gates' ground because Dobbo was there. And I think that was the, the 21st that night. And Kev, it was, I think it was Kev was basically off to the UK the next day. And I thought we'll probably see Kev in, you know, 12 years when he comes back and you knew that was what was going to happen. So similar mentality. Um, and, and I think also then the other thing is the quality. Like if I took them on, on the pitch to do, if I'd be bringing them back from rehab drills or whatever else um, and having done similar sort of drills with the ball, with guys, you know, that, uh, that are playing today, you know, I, I still remember, um, during this six-week um, thing with Vinny. And I remember having these poles with numbers on them and he'd have to do a bit of shielding the ball and so forth, drop, do, a, do a, some sort of sprint drills, maybe a ladder, and just be quite exhausted. And then he'd have to run with me, exhausted, to then turn and I'd say three or two. And every one of them was... A, um, a tracer bullet that I then had to go and put the pole back in the ground. And that was over 30, 35 metres. And if you go back and watch some of those Socceroo games when um, Milo Sturjovski's playing, I think it's the one against maybe Croatia in the, the World Cup. And it's just he's flying up the wing and the, the touch is perfect. But again, Vinny's just positioned himself and just cracked this 40-yard diag ball, and it's just hit the player on the run brilliantly. And I'd seen that in training so many times. And if I did a similar sort of thing with Bresh on crossing or with Harry on shooting or whatever else, it was like the, the, the repeat quality. So there was the repeat fitness, there was the mentality, but then there was the repeat quality of just, yep, he's put that there, he's hit the target again, he's hit the target again, which then you, you sort of looked at, this next generation as well. And there was, if they got a bit fatigued, because of course they weren't fit in the first place, yeah. the moment the fatigue dropped, the quality dropped. And that's, that's a massive difference. Yeah. Okay. So you work, you've worked with some modern day, well, they're not so far gone, but some current players, let's, let's use that terminology um, of late. Who are some of your prime examples that you've worked with and why? Yeah. Was it just fitness or was it injuries? Yeah, it's sort of more, more that it's sort of injury stuff. You give them um, opportunities um, sort of uh, in the off-season if they came back. That was probably Vinny's one big lesson, as was John Aloisi's, as was, um, and certainly Bresh as well, was that you went to pre-season over wherever you were overseas fit. You had a couple of weeks off with the family, and then that was just to refresh your brain. Then, even if you went to a resort somewhere or whatever else, you would, um, you know, you would basically go and um, spend three weeks with someone, conditioning yourself, working on any d discrepancies, deficiencies, imbalances, yeah. so that by the time you got to the team's pre-season, you were flying and set up to go up a, another level. And that was a big thing about those guys. So we started doing that with some of the younger ones. So, you know, we sort of, uh, we started doing that sort of thing with Stefan Mork at, at 16. Um, we, you know, 
Ben Garuccio has been back with me recently. He's been at Hearts. He unfortunately did his ACL. So that's that's another thing we do a lot for those overseas players. Is obviously it's a pretty brutal world over there. And so you know the doc over there says, "Oh well, you've done your knee. Fuck off back to Australia," and that's kind of what it's like. So I'll be on the phone, organise the surgeons for them here. They get operated on. They spend a twelve week block so that at least by the time they go back to the club, they're ready to hit the ground running. So that's that's an occurrence for us quite regularly. Um, you know, whether it was so we've we got Ben Garuccio, we've sort of uh, Danny De Silva has been one. We tried to sort of get as much strength and conditioning stuff into him to try and get his game up that, that next level. Um, and then probably one of my more enjoyable ones um, was uh, Josh Brillante. Yep. He was a kid that I really thought, um, Vinny and I had a few discussions around, that I just thought because of his physicality and his strength that I think Vinny might have had a soft spot for him, you know, to make him into that number six like himself. And I remember saying to him, I said, you know what, these kids aren't adapting well to culture shock, you know. I reckon you chuck him into England. I mean, he'll play 10 years as an overlapping fullback in the championship and be a jet because his body will actually be able to stand the, the rough and tumble. Yeah. Um, so he really struggled to adapt at his time in Italy. And I think that that was a big shift for him where he went from winning under 21 player at Newcastle to then all of a sudden being, um, you know, being, I think his first practice game was against a small club called Real Madrid. And he looked on yeah. the other side, yeah. there was Ronaldo. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just think it was like, what's in my underpants right now? can't believe, pinch myself and so yeah, so he, he sort of really battled and then he tried to sort of adapt to the Italian way and he lost all those things about himself that were the Aussie thing that was, a, he was a bull, he was strong, all of a sudden he's losing four or five kilos and trying to be a ball player and it's like stick with what you're good at um, and obviously he's come back here and done done fantastically well yeah, and he's yeah. a, a delightful young kid, I had a lot of time for him. Um, so yeah, so there's been a, been a group of those, and and then still some of the the uh, the Melbourne Heart boys that have gone off, like the the you know the Gold Gold Mabratus have been playing in Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and telling me about you know just pretty archaic training methods, and trying to then give them a you know um, you know hand certainly James Troisi when he was gearing up for the Asian Cup and the World Cup. Um, the first of his World Cup. I think he missed out the squad the second time. But, yeah, just to go, I think he went to China. Uh, he had a spell in um, Saudi Arabia and we'd often do these little video conferences where he'd say, you know, my hip's sore and, you know, they'd be treating with pretty archaic methods and you'd get him to do some video stuff and say, when did you hurt your right ankle? And, oh, that was six weeks ago. Yeah, well, okay, we'll start rehabbing your ankle and we'll get your hip sorted out. So... Been a lot of been a lot of those sort of ones as well, but um, great gr- great stories with all those kids. Just uh, you work with some, some other sports as well, now, don't you? It's not just soccer. You do work. Yeah, with so the- I, I sort of worked a, f- a fair bit with um, a range of the AFL guys. So with uh, TLA or ESP, as it was known, we used to screen a lot of the young um, AFL hopefuls pre-draft. Um, so whether it was you know, way back when, you know, worked closely with sort of Fraser Gehrig on his last two or three years when he was sort of kicking 100 goals a year and um, through to, uh, you know, I remember in the early days there was a clinic with, with the clinic we had in South Yarra where the acupuncturist I had in there was um, we, we were sort of working on this OP, osteitis pubis sort of stuff with the acupuncture. And I remember in one day I think he had Chris Judd, uh, he had Jason Akamanis and um, the boy from the Bulldogs with the red hair, a bit of a character, won the brown low. Cooney. Adam Cooney. Adam Cooney, correct. Yeah. And I remember saying, looking at his book in the morning, I said, geez, you're doing all right, are you? You're only doing brown low medalists on Tuesday. <laughs> um, and so, and also a lot of the, a lot of those older AFL boys as well that, you know, had good careers, um, you know, I've sort of enjoyed treating them because it's an interesting one. A lot of the groin stuff, the guys that went through AFL, basketball, soccer, um, who had constant adductor problems, 
which no one would have gone for a hip x-ray in those days, but have all had hip replacements and hip resurfacings. And I often joke that, you know, you're getting old when you're rehabilitating the hip replacements of players you played with, mm. of which I remember when, um, if you remember, Peter Cocker. Yeah. Cocker said. Yeah. So, um, you know, he had his, his hips bilaterally replaced. And so there was lots of good banter throughout of his, his rehab. But uh, he was another one that was just always two weeks, play two games, miss a game. And it's just all those guys that, um, you know, I've worked pretty closely with a range of orthopaedic surgeons over a long time with these athletes and now to come up with some protocols that just make sure that this sort of stuff doesn't get missed. And if they're 16, 17 and 18, we get them sorted early, doing the right stuff to give them every chance of just not having careers like that. I enjoyed I enjoyed my time with the um, the the cricket boys as well. Like I still have a, a great relationship with a lot of the boys I treated there who had sort of hip issues. Um, Bobby Quiney, Peter Siddle, who I still see a fair bit of even now, and um, we're pretty close with James Pattinson through his his sort of uh, um, stress fractures in his back. Um, with his core and glute sort of stuff and giving him a better understanding. I thought the, the funny part of the story with the cricket all comes together where um, probably some six or seven years ago, but there was a, a player called um, Nathaniel Chalabar, who's currently at Watford, but he was in, a captain of England under 21s um, and he had the, the fortune of uh, winning a title with Chelsea. Be- beautiful athlete. So... Vinny and his boss, Frank Trimbley, over in London, rang me about uh, yeah, seven or eight years ago with this 17-year-old talent uh, who was at Chelsea who had OP and was really struggling with the training. And obviously, you mention it to the physios. It makes you look weak. And, you know, as he said at the time, he said, if I'd have gone and got on the bed at the physio at Chelsea seven or eight years ago, all that would have happened was John Terry and Frank Lampard would have come up to me and said, how old are you, son? I'm 17. Fuck off, you know. And um, so I went over, I flew over um, and spent four weeks or well, three and a half weeks in London based on basically four or five hours a day just getting this kid right. Mm. Um, and I said to Frank and Vinny, I said, but I'll, I'll using my cricket contacts, we'll, we'll take him out of his comfort zone. So... We, uh, I trained him out of Lords for uh, three and a half, four weeks. And I've got a great story where he's walking up the stairs in the old pavilion at Lords, which with the physio room is sort of right at the back of the, the change rooms where you famously saw Warney going off with the stump. And um, anyway, he's walked through and he's, he's said with his great English accent, he's like, I've got no idea who any of these geezers are. And, like, there was, you know, Clive Lloyd and, you know, every great cricketer that ever played. No idea. And then he's turned, he's gone, but that's Shane Warne. And it was like, even the African kid born in England, you know, is playing Premier League, knows who Warne is. Who was your your contact at Lloyd's, just out of curiosity? um, No, so we we were dealing with a, a technology at the time called First Beat. Okay. Um, which was sort of looking at heart rate variability. And so the guys that were running that was the one of the partners was the physio at Lords. So I just said, look, I've got a, a footballer. And they said, look, yep, yeah, on us, have the gym, have the physio room. Um, and he it was great because it got him to just completely relax, knowing he wasn't around football, yeah. no one knew him, and he could just talk about what was stressing him and all the things that were required to get him right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he came back within a couple of years and broke into that first team and got himself a, 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 a championship or prem, Premier League title, which is terrific. Very good, very good. Another success story for you. Yeah, no, and, and for the players, most importantly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I know that you put your heart and soul in it and, uh, you know, you get your reward and they get their reward and their reward is obviously getting back on the track and doing what they're good at. And yeah. you understand that better than anyone with your background and your playing history. Yeah. Um, and the, the journey that you, that's you got you to where you are. Um, yeah. They, they may or may not know that story, but that story is key to their success. That's how it happens. Yeah. 
Yeah. Isn't it really? That's 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 the root Pretty of cool. what you were doing. Yeah, yeah. Giving them giving them a, an, an education and an understanding of what they need to do. Yeah. And then once they've got that, they can run with it. Yeah, which you didn't get. Correct, correct. <laughs> but it's funny, you know, like a, a quick story, sorry to, you know, no, no, ramble no, on. Yeah. I thought this is a funny one too the other day yeah. where just on a bit of watch this space, so I got a phone call from um, Sasha Janowski about um, probably call it 10, 12 weeks ago. And um, I've looked after a few of his boys now. He's coaching down at Dandy and, and, and so forth. Anyway, he rang me and he said, look, you would have played against Mickey and Ivan Kalina back in the day. I said, oh, absolutely. Who couldn't remember being uh, leaving the St Albans Dinamo ground without a police escort at some stage in the old state league days? And um, anyway, so Ivan's um, son, Mate, is now seven foot tall, um, is playing basketball at the University of Hawaii, mm-hmm. uh, was touted by a lot of AFL clubs um, as well, chose basketball. So I've had him down working with my um, dear friend, Bowden Babchek, who I get to do a lot of the sprint work like I've done with, you know, the Stefan Morks and the, you know, and Scotty Galloway's and so yeah. forth yeah. to really try and improve their, their, their mechanics and their, their abilities to turn quick, repeat efforts. And so Bowden's been a, it was a high performance at Hawthorne in Melbourne uh, in the nineties and is probably one of the best running coaches I'd say in the world for, for sport in particular. And so he's had, the likes of the Kudafidis and Crawfords and all those. And so the, the list of his elite talent over the journey through AFL has been amazing. Um, and he's, he reckons that Marte on a, on a engine level is up there with Crawf at his peak and the kid's only 20. Wow. So it's one of those ones if we can really harness it. Yeah. But again, where, how did the relationship occur? Through football. Yeah, where it all comes back to, doesn't it? Those friendships and that background yeah. and this is why we're having this conversation because I love what you're doing today. Um, you know, obviously our friendship is very recent. Um, yeah. but we're connected through football and mutual yeah. friends and, and the like. I love what you do today, but I know that so much of it stems from the background that you had in the game and in your case, maybe the hardship or... The, you know, the disappointment of perhaps not going but and moving on and doing other things, but it's that driving force behind. And like you said, it still comes back to friendships, still comes back to relationships, yeah. still comes back to the network um, and what you put in, you get out. And what I've taken away from, from this, which doesn't surprise me because obviously I've dealt with you um, over the last few years, is that um, people come to you because they trust you. Yeah. Right? That's That's... The bottom line, isn't it? They trust you. Yeah. Or have I missed something? Have I missed the story? Because that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. And you, you know you're going to get... And I think, I think there's another thing that I reckon growing up in that time with you, you know, and I, I, I talk a lot about, you know, you know, even treating like that Andy Humble in the other week and Dougie Hodgson the week before and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of those guys, you know, as as human beings were pretty tough, you know, and, um, but as much as they gave you a young bloke and Jimmy McBride or, um, you know, any of the, any of the guys at South, you know, as much as they gave you a clip and even, you know, they gave you a cuddle as well. And I think that's the bit that's, that's often missed today that as one of my big points is that like, there was a great moment in tennis where the, the number one woman in the world at the time was being sprayed by Darren Kale, the coach, and telling her that she had to do better, it wasn't good enough, and the, and the, the TV was on there. And as they were watching that particular footage, there was all this furor about how dare he speak to someone that way and blah, blah, blah. But what people in elite sport miss is all the cuddles and all of the conversations you've had when they've been in tears on the bench because they're injured again or, um, you know, so forth, that then if there is a clip, 
which they have to be able to respond to a clip, otherwise I won't make it in the sport anyway. Yeah, that's in, right. in that world, that you know, you end up ending in that situation where it's like that stuff's really important. You can get a clip, but if there's a lot of cuddles and nurturance along the way, which I always felt I got as well, and and that becomes a big part, I reckon, of creating an environment where you can treat and get players back on the park. Right. I think if if you love someone or something, at some point there's still along that journey, there's got to be an element or a dose of tough love, doesn't it? Have to. Yeah. Have to. Just, and just I look for the yin and yang. Just for the yeah, yin correct. And, yang. and if you grow up always being told how, you know, and I found that even with players when I was pretty hard on them with some of these new generation guys at 21, 20, 21, 22, that I felt there was areas they weren't working hard in or they'd patted themselves on their back a bit early. And then sometimes even at the expense of the relationship in the short term, which wouldn't have happened probably in the old days, but, you know, on a respect level, I always had their respect. So I was close enough to them to give them that kind of feedback. Often I'd get a call and, you know, it was two years later, they'd come back and go, you're actually right on that one. You know, whereas they surround them, if they surround themselves by too many yes men in their locker telling them how fantastic they are, they're not going to get where they need to. No, there's not enough balance in that, is there? No. No, it's, detri- it's detrimental to anything you're trying to achieve, whether it's sport, work, a relationship, whatever. It's just detriment. It's not going to work. It's unrealistic. Yeah. Because yeah. life's, not, not, life's not a bed of roses, as they say. You've got to, well, have, a, you've got to have the... Nors, you know, Nors, I looked at uh, the young lad, Will Kelly. I've worked with the Kelly boys, you know, Jake and obviously Ned in the AFL for many, many years. And Will had his first game for Collingwood finally after a number of injury disappointments, scores the first goal of the game and then breaks his arm. And that's that's the tough part of elite sport of, you know, in the space of that amount of time, you can be hero to zero in two seconds. And if you haven't got that mentality, um, you know, then it's it's tough. Well, it's a hurdle. And sometimes the hurdles come far apart. And sometimes, like you said, they come that far apart. You still yeah. got to handle it. Still got to yeah. deal with it. Excellent. And Mate, this has been an sorry. Go, go. No, so, fo- so football and sport, as a metaphor for life, just can be so fantastic if it's looked at that way. One hundred percent, hundred percent right. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I knew I would, um, hence why I uh, wanted to have a chat with you. I really have um, enjoyed delving into the uh, the professional side of um, who you are currently, but as per our story, I can see where it stems from, where it's come from and the journey you've taken. And I love the fact that you started as a young soccer attacker and you're still going at soccer and you're still giving it and you haven't lost your passion, you haven't lost your drive. Um, and along the journey, you're helping so many people in so many ways. It's uh, sensational, mate. Long may continue. Um, thank you again for your time. I do appreciate it. I'm eating into your yeah. private time. Um, yeah. uh, and it's a great story and I'm, I'm happy to share it with people. And I look forward to catching up with you after COVID. Um, we should have done this over a beer. Correct. Sooner, but uh, yeah. for whatever reason, we haven't. But uh, it's good to spend time with you and chat. And I look forward to uh, catching up with you in the future. Thanks, George. Well, we'll keep in touch, definitely, mate. Good on you, mate. Thank you very much.